Okay, folks, we're going to call the meeting to order. Okay, please take a seat. All right. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second night of the 2023 annual town meeting, and the goal is to have it the last night of the 2023 annual meeting. Um, we're going to call to order. This is the uh, come out of recess from the uh, uh, events of last night. I want to go over a couple of basics here. First of all, to vote, you have to have a yellow card tonight. If you flash the green card from last night, you will not have a vote to count. So please make sure you've got your new yellow card. Uh, in terms of voting, um, look, it's a much smaller crowd tonight. It's going to be much easier to count. Uh, and uh, thankfully, people aren't standing up, which threw the count off last night. So it should go easily and it should go quickly. However, when we ask you to rise, please pull up your card high so the counters can survive the evening with more success than much of last night, unfortunately, caused them. Um, so we'll make this go promptly. All right. Let me also talk about the meeting tonight. This is a continuation of the meeting of last night. So we will go back into the articles. We're going to start with Article 10. Um, in terms of speaking, I just want to go over some basics. If you have a question, if you have a point of order, you direct that to me, the moderator. You do not start screaming across the room to get somebody's attention. Please come to a mic, ask for a point of order to me. I will address it, and we will deal with it promptly. In terms of the motions, remember that motions actually have to be written. They may be stated, but you'll have to come up here and write it up on the table, which uh, a few people had to do last night. So just remember, motions themselves have to be written. Once again, remind you that if you know you're going to speak to an article, don't be shy. Get in line. Get ready to speak right away. Things will move along um, at a more even pace that way. All right. Uh, we are going to say the Pledge of Allegiance one more time, however. So please rise. All right, a quorum is now being called as we have more than 30 people in the room. Article 10, it is, and that would be Mr. Buttrick. Or are you doing it now? I'm Ms. McKinnon. All set? Yes. I, Nina McKinnon, move that the town vote to appropriate the sum of nine million one hundred ninety-eight thousand five hundred. Sorry, nine million one hundred ninety-eight five hundred forty-five thousand, as follows: A, raised by taxation the sum of two million one hundred twenty-six six hundred thirty-one thousand for debt repayment, principal, and interest. B, transfer from the cemetery sale of lots fund the sum of four thousand to the cemetery budget. C. Transfer from the cemetery lot care fund, the sum of 12250 to the cemetery budget. D. Transfer from the cemetery perpetual care fund, the sum of $349 to the cemetery budget. Transfer from the town technology fund, the sum of 9520 to the town IT budget. Transfer from the ambulance fund the sum of 50000 to the ambulance budget. And G, to raise by taxation the sum of $6,995,795,000 to be allocated between the salaries and expenses of the town according to the remaining budget items as indicated in the Finance Committee report. And to authorize the Finance Committee to permit budget line item transfers within a department from salary line 
to salary lines and from expense lines to expense lines. These are on page 12 to 22 of your pink booklet, and this is the 50% of the budget that is not related to the schools or water or sewer. Second. All right. I need the, you have to give it back. Thank you. Any, any discussion? None. <laughs> Hearing nothing, all those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed? Duly noted, motion carries. Article 11. Wesley, I believe. There he is. Good evening, Wesley Burnham, EPW Commissioner, 22 County Road. Hi, right, Wesley Burnham, move that the town vote to transfer from the sewer enterprise free cash sum of $80,000 for the purpose of funding the sewer enterprise fund for the remainder of fiscal year 2023. Second. Any discussion? Hearing uh, none. Oh, briefly, oh. the $80,000 is to cover uh, some changes in the rates charged to us by Gloucester for the sewer. Pretty much it. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Article 12. Mr. Burnham. Hi, Wesley Burnham. Move that the town vote to appropriate the sum of $2,310,507 for fiscal year 24. Sewer so enterprise front budget as follows. A, debt repayment, principal and interest, the sum of $896,952 from sewer betterments, and the sum of $328,911 to be raised by taxation. Funds to be allocated between the salaries and expenses of the sewer department, $1,084,000. Six hundred and forty-four from department receipts, as all as indicated in the finance committee report, and authorize the finance committee to permit budget line item transfers within the sewer department from salary lines to salary lines and expense lines to expense lines. Seconded. Any discussion? Questions? Quiet night. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries unanimously. Article 13. Mr. Burnham, that would be you. Break down and get my glasses on. There we go. Hi, Wesley Burnham. Move that the town vote to transfer from the Water Enterprise Free Cash Fund the sum of $25,000 for the purpose of funding the Water Enterprise Fund for the remainder of fiscal year 2023. Any second? Thank you. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 14. Hi, Wesley Burnham moved that the town vote to appropriate the sum of $877,416 for the fiscal year 2024 Water Enterprise Fund budget as follows. A, debt repayment, principal and interest, the sum of $17,636 from water betterments, the sum of $27,862 from department receipts, raise and appropriate the sum of $7,475 and B, funds to be allocated between salaries and expenses of the Water Department of $824,443 from department receipts 
uh, all as indicated on the Finance Committee report, and to authorize the Finance Committee to permit budget line item transfers within the Water Department from salary lines to salary lines and from expense lines to expense lines. Second. So seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 15, Ms. Perrine. I, Ruth R. Perrine, move that the town vote to amend Chapter 1 of the Town of Essex Bylaws by adding a new Section 1-5 pertaining to the town clerk's maintenance of the numbering and formatting of the Town of Essex Bylaws as shown in Article 15 of the Warrant. So seconded. Discussion. This just allows, if there's a new bylaw, it allows the town clerk the ability to pop it into the proper section. It's kind of simple. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 16, which I believe Mr. Cook was going to do, but I think you're doing, Cliff. Thanks. I'd like to make a motion to indefinitely postpone Article 16. Warrant. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say, if you have a question, go to the podium, the, excuse me, to the mic. Why? Thank you so much for asking. <laughs> Our board is a, supposed to be a board of seven, and we've been very frustrated trying to recruit two more members over the last several months, and it's the same. We have a board of five now, minus two, and the quorum for the board is four, regardless of whether we have four, five, six, or seven members. So there's a core group of us, and uh, we'd love to have two more members. So uh, to uh, withstand the withering criticism of trying to uh, consolidate power and uh, stop people from building anything in town, uh, to the contrary, we would like to have two more members, and so we're going to give it another go for another few months and uh, see if we can have some people step up and show up. Uh, we'd love to it's actually have to send a letter of interest to the selectmen, and uh, we would have a full board. And that is our intention, to have a full board. The article was put forward in our frustration uh, that we've been unable to have a full board, and uh, we only have a quorum of four. We were trying to get a quorum of three, so once in a while, somebody could miss a meeting. So that's, that's why. If, if, if you're, um, please say your name and address. Yeah, hi, uh, Brendan Riley, 15 Burnham Court. Um, if, if you're looking for new members for the commission and you think you may find volunteers, maybe we push this to the fall meeting. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Once it's indefinitely postponed, then it comes up at another. Oh, I missed the postponement part. Thank you. Yep. Motion to postpone. Right. Just to clarify, this is a motion to indefinitely postpone the article. So, we have a second. No further discussion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And before we move on, I just want to say that if anyone is interested in participating on the CONCOM, please, please talk to Cliff or any other member of the, of the, or the selectmen, or certainly talk to the selectmen. Um, we are always looking for volunteers. The CONCOM does important work. It should not be in a position to be down two votes and be incapable of functioning on a reasonable and prompt basis. All right. Article 17. Cliff? Uh, we're going to make a motion to indefinitely postpone Article 17, okay. town meeting warrant. Okay. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 18, Ms. O'Donnell. 
I, Lisa O'Donnell, move that the town vote to renumber and revise the Essex zoning bylaw of the town from its original numbering and arrangement as amended through May 2, 2nd, 2022 to the numbering, codification, arrangement, sequence, and captions, including updating section references in the text of the bylaw where applicable and as shown, all is set forth on the handout titled Reorganized Essex Zoning Bylaw. Do you have a second? Any discussion? Yeah. <laughs> um, so everyone should have had an opportunity to pick up the pink handout, which is a two-page summary of the changes that were made in the reorganized bylaw and also um, <laughs> the little bylaw itself here. So there's all 58 pages of it for you to review at your leisure. Um, first off, I would like to say that the planning board held a hearing public hearing on this article as we're required to do for any zoning bylaw changes. That was held on April 19th. Exactly zero people showed up. Um, and the planning board took a vote at the conclusion of that meeting whether they supported the article or not. Um, six members present voted unanimously to support this article. And the seventh member who was absent has also separately endorsed that. So this article has the unanimous support of the planning board. A little background. Um, before I start on the background for the bylaw update, I want to make a very clear distinction about the MAPC, who is the state agency who is supporting our, bylaw, our work on the bylaw. This is the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and their official duties include doing things just like this project, helping municipalities with expert guidance on zoning bylaws. This group should not be confused with the MBTA, which is the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, and which is the subject of a recent state law regarding MBTA communities, or 3A communities, which refers to Section 3A of the Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A on zoning. This recently added section requires towns to have zoning districts that allow for certain thresholds of multifamily housing by right. The MAPC has already helped Essex with the interim compliance requirements for this new regulation. We have met these requirements with our downtown district and do not have to make any changes to anything about our bylaw to comply. So this is entirely a non-issue here in Essex, regardless of what you may hear about changes in other towns, but not here. We are already compliant as is. So the article in front of you. Through grant funding from the state DHCD, which is the Department of Housing and Community Development, in 2001, the MAPC helped the planning board in the town with phase one of this project. In the course of this work, they reviewed and evaluated our zoning bylaw and undertook a lot of community outreach to learn what residents, businesses, property owners, and other stakeholders do and do not like about our bylaw. They provided a final report for phase one late last spring, which is available on the town website. Last October, the town received another grant from the DHCD with a match from the MAPC to fund the work on phase two of this project. In this phase, we'll be working with MACP on actual updates and additions to our bylaw. As the very first step of this work and is recommended by the MAPC, who works with towns all over our region, we are proposing a reorganization of our bylaw. The reorganized format is simply better organized and groups similar portions of our existing bylaw together. This allows for less confusion and ambiguity when certain topics are addressed multiple places. For example, in future updates, but not tonight, we will be able to put all definitions in one section, to define dimensional standards in one spot, to provide graphics to illustrate these and other updates like tables and charts. The new format will make the bylaw more user-friendly and also flexible if and when we add other changes or requirements, but not tonight. <laughs> but right now, the article in front of us is asking for approval for the reorganized bylaw. The only new aspect of the bylaw is the new outline and headings. Every single word and every bit of punctuation from our existing bylaw has been meticulously copied verbatim into a new spot in the proposed outline. Not a single word has changed from the existing bylaw to the proposed reorganized bylaw. As the next article tonight will show, even the typos got copied and carried over. There are absolutely no substantive changes whatsoever in this reorganized version in front of you here tonight. New placeholder sections have been added, but these are empty in this version. They are just placeholders which may or may not be filled in the future. The rest of the project will de determine that. 
The planning board is working to be very deliberate and transparent about changes that may be proposed later on. We'll continue to work with the MAPC and do our utmost to engage residents and property owners, and we invite everyone to learn and engage as we embark on this process. For tonight, we're simply asking for this first step for this reorganized outline that does not change the substance of the bylaw at all. Thank you. Any further discussion? You timed it right. That was the end of it. All right, no further discussion. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank By the you. way, that did require a two-thirds vote, but obviously we had more than two-thirds. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Article 19. Lisa? And this also requires a two-thirds vote. I, Lisa O'Donnell, move that the town vote to make changes to the Essex zoning bylaw as shown in Article 19 of the warrant. This is summarized in your handbook here, and I will just sort of recap what the two changes are. The first one is a little oh, wait, wait, complicated, oh. but it really Lisa. is a typo. Oh. Any second? second? Discussion. The first change, which is item number one, and this is on page six if you want to look at it. Um, it's a portion of the downtown zoning bylaw that was passed um, a year and a half ago. And in there is a section, which is um, section A there that says special permit changes. Um, and it's under section, as said in the outline there, under non-conforming lots and structures. So this is a section that's entitled non-conforming lots and structures. And what happened is that you can see in item two, Non-conforming is bold-faced, so that's what we're adding. And conforming is in strike-through, so we're taking conforming out. And that was a typo. The non got lost off the front of conforming. So this is a, a section of the bylaw that addresses non-conforming lots, so this clearly should have been non-conforming and not conforming. So that's the first change. And the second is spelling from um, principal with IC. C-I-P-L-E to C-I-P-A-L. And that occurs in the sections listed here. And I'll answer any questions. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 20, Mr. Neal. Yes, you do, thank you. I forgot to get Good evening. Ed Neal, 15 Western Ave. I, Edward Neal, move that the town vote to rescind the article, the vote of Article 33 of the annual town meeting of May 4, 2015, by which the town adopted the Stretch Energy Code and to delete Section 2 24 Stretch Energy Code from the town's bylaws. Do a second? Give it a chance to get back. Any discussion? Uh, the Stretch Energy Code is a local option extension of the state building code, which is enforced by the town's building inspector. Historically, the building code was enacted to ensure that buildings were safe for human habitation. The Stretch Code deals with the energy efficiency of newly constructed or renovated structures. At the time the town voted to adopt this code, it was widely viewed as a reasonable measure requiring specific insulation, insulation measures to economize on energy. It seemed reasonable because although the new requirements cost more than traditional methods, the homeowner might enjoy a financial benefit in lower energy costs. In practice, this turned into a very intrusive and costly measure, especially in renovating older buildings which, requi which required pre previously unnecessary expensive restructuring just to install the required amounts of insulation. So far, the contractors and building owners sucked it up and did what was required. It's unclear who or what was the driving force behind the town's adoption of this code, but it qualified the town for certain benefits on its own buildings for being a green community. The cost to building permit applications was extensive, however. Unfortunately, when the town adopted the stretch code, 
and incorporated it into our bylaws, the motion used the language as it may amend, be amended from time to time. Now the legislature is act, enacting addendums to the code which go far beyond insulation that will also apply to us. They are clearly aimed at forcing people into servitude to the electric utilities. New homes and commercial buildings must be all electric, and if they are not, they must be pre-wired for solar panels, appliances, and electric car charging stations. To accomplish this, extensive engineering documents and certifications must be prepared and submitted as part of the permitting process. These provisions will limit citizens' choices of energy options and, in my opinion, put the population at risk in the case of extreme weather or a failure of the electric grid. Our natural gas, propane, and wood-burning appliances currently provide some security in these instances, but putting all our eggs in one basket, energy basket, is dangerous and foolhardy. It's more frustrating when you consider that the elites that are pushing these measures and advocate for affordable housing have done nothing to enhance our power grid, while their efforts here exponentially increase the cost of constructing new housing. Efforts to build transmission lines through Maine from Canada hydropower has been stymied. A natural gas pipeline through upstate New York that would power electric plants to supply the East Coast has also been blocked. We haven't built a new power station in decades. We are being driven to a crisis, and so far we have taken it as we die the death of a thousand cuts. While our bylaw is only a few paragraphs, right here on the bottom of this page, the stretch code is voluminous, and I challenge any layperson to decipher it. Our open-ended adoption of it will doom us to comply with even more onerous provisions in the years to come. I collected signatures and placed this article on the warrant to give citizens the opportunity to stand up and say, enough. If we vote for this, any person who wishes to comply with any or all of the provisions of the stretch code will be free to do so. Just the blanket mandate will be lifted. The, there are state and federal tax and benefits for those who do comply. No one is depriving anyone of their rights. Let's not make the building inspector the energy police. Please join me in ensuring the diversity and inclusivity of our energy choices. Thank you. Hi, Gil Frieden, 104 John Wise Ave. Uh, no on Article 20. Um, no, we are uh, considered a green community. Essex is a green community, and I can't in good conscience in 2023 vote to remove Essex being a green community. So no on 20. Cliff. Hi, I'm Cliff Agaloff. I six been a licensed builder since 1983. I had a master's degree and I couldn't get a job. I got a construction supervisor's license and I've been employed my whole life. Anyway, I would like to ask through the moderator if we vote in favor of Mr. Neal's measure, if we would um, endanger any green community funds. Could we ask that question? Mr. Zabricki? The, the question was, if Sorry. the town votes to abandon the stretch energy code, will the town be able to avail itself of green community grant funds in the future? The answer is no. Uh, in order to continue to be a green community, the town will need to continue to have the uh, stretch energy code adopted. Oh. That's very interesting. I was going to 100% support Mr. Neal's motion because the current building code in Massachusetts uh, absorbed and codified about 75 to 80 percent of the measures that are included in the stretch code. And in many, many ways, the stretch code um, is obsolete. The stretch code at the time stepped up various aspects of building envelope and building performance that uh, was mandated before the rest of the code caught up. So I support Mr. Neal, but for 100% different reasons. The reality is that the new code that's in force today covers the vast majority of the items that were in the stretch code. Thank you. Jay? Uh, Jay Tetzloff, uh, 98 Western. 
I'm not a builder. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I came to town five years ago, flat broke. I bought a 300-year-old house with no insulation whatsoever. I had no idea what it would cost to heat it, but I can tell you from experience, I'm handy. There is still no insulation in the house, and I've cut my energy use probably 75% by focusing on windows, doors, weather stripping, and just this last year, I upgraded the electrical service to put two heat pumps in, so I had the choice whether to keep using the boiler or putting the mini, you know, using the mini splits, the heat pumps. I did all that for probably less than $10,000 altogether. So I, I bristle, and I, this is totally extemp. I didn't even know I was going to talk about this, but I, I urge you to vote yes for this. There are other ways to do this, and don't be scared by all of this uh, talk about what you have to do to your house in order to be compliant. It's just not true. You can reduce your energy use with simple things. I think it's there. No, you can do it. Ladies before Jim. Another Scotsman. Hi, I have a question, two questions for Brennan. Did you just say that if Na we... Name, name and Annie Cameron Pickering Street. <laughs> Did you just say that if we... If we turn... Uh, what are we doing? Reverse this that we won't be a green community and we will not have that green community grant money? Correct. That okay. is a prerequisite of maintaining status as a green community. Okay. So the threat there is that we've used a lot of those grants to do really important work in this building and in other buildings. And I wonder if you could just give us kind of a taste of some of the, yes. the monies we've been able to... Um, so there have been three, I think, three major projects in this building to the tune of hundred and thirty hundred and forty thousand dollars a piece we used um, some of the grant funding when town hall was renovated because money was uh, the the green community grant um, saw even the renovation of the town hall the energy aspects of it as being eligible we um, even got some aspects of the new station um, that and also you you probably all noticed that um, there was a change to LED street lights. Um, a good portion of that change was paid for by the Green Community Grant Program. That said, we probably have in the time between 2015 and now um, gotten most of the mileage out of the Green Community Grant Program because the other things that we could probably delve into would include things such as solar farms and wind farms and putting things on buildings, et cetera, which haven't been very palatable to date. Doesn't mean that the town couldn't think of those things or try to do those things, but we, we have done most of the things that were easier to get at if you will, with the green community funds to date. Thank you. Angus Bruce, 51 Pond Street. Um, I deal with uh, quite a bit of construction um, in more than several towns. I've talked to multiple building inspectors about this new energy code. All of them, save none, have said they can't even figure it out it's so complicated that a lot of it doesn't work. A lot of it doesn't make sense. It's overreaching. And this is what they're telling me. So um, I think we should support not supporting this new energy fund, that, this new energy code that they're putting in place because it's, it's not well thought out. It's extremely overreaching um, and it's trying to force people to do electric with no real reason behind it. So I think you should vote accordingly. Thank you. Mr. Renzi? Yeah. Uh, Mark Renzi, 86 Southern. Uh, that's louder than I thought, sorry. Um, I guess this is pretty confusing. I, mean, I think we're in, a, in a, an environment where it seems like had more droughts, it's getting worse. We're, we're, they're trying to establish a building code that makes things greener. However, it's not clear in Article 20 what the real impact is going to be. So I, I make a motion to postpone. 
Article 20 until we really understand the impacts of what this will do to Essex. And then secondly, um, I have a question to Brendan. You know, what other towns, what have other towns in the metropolitan area done in terms of this? Have they also voted to overturn this? And how do, how do we think about that on a relative basis? And does this fundamentally make building in Essex easier um, if we vote for Article 20? Thank you. Brendan, so hold, the, hold up one second. Mark, if I may make a suggestion, why don't you ask your question before you file your motion? Um, can I just reverse the order and not repeat them for yes. simplicity? I'd like to reverse the order of my questions. When, after he answers the question, okay, you have you. a time to make so the, fir the first question is, what other towns are also green communities? Um, I'm asking if other towns have done the same thing as Article 20 is accomplishing, trying to accomplish. And, and I, I am not aware of other towns um, going, going to a non-green community status after attaining that status. Uh, I, would ha I would also say, though, there are large changes afoot in the code, and perhaps Essex is, is looking at, you know, this thing and others may follow, I don't know. But I'm not aware of any others that have. Okay. And what okay. was the second part? I mean, fundamentally, the, the question is, you know, you know, how does this affect us overall in terms of building and construction here? Are we making it easier to build here? And are we making it so we can be less green by adopting what's proposed? I would say that um, the complexity of a build, if someone doesn't want to follow it because it's not no longer required, um, decreases. So I would say with decreased complexity and equipment comes a simpler build for less money. With respect to whether or not um, homes will still homes that are built will still be energy efficient, um, as Mr. Agalov said. The standard building code already has many features that require certain energy efficiencies, including insulation. Um, but the people, anyone who wants to go to the level of all those things, all the bells and whistles, still can. So it, it could be a way to look at it that, again, nobody's losing anything, but you're just not being forced to comply with provisions of the code that are out over and above the base code. All right, I have a question here, Greg. Your firm represents a lot of towns. The last time I looked, you represented more towns than any other law firm in the Commonwealth. Are you aware of any towns that have rescinded um, the stretch energy code? Okay. Just can you speak into the microphone, please? Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, um, I am not aware of, of any towns that have um, rescinded um, the stretch energy code or lost their green community status. Um, I did try to search for that information and did not um, find any results of towns that have done that. Okay. So is it, is it fair to say that we'd be going backwards by voting yes for this? Mark, Mark, questions come to me. Sorry, to the moderator. Excuse me. Thank you. You want to ask the question again? Uh, Mr. Moderator, is it fair to say that we'd be going backwards and making it less expensive to build in Essex? And, and is, are, are we going backwards in terms of making this uh, relative to other towns? Brendan, are you in your position to respond to Well, since not every community is a green community and some towns haven't, haven't adopted, I wouldn't say one is forward and one is backward. I think it's, it's a choice. It comes down to whether or not the people in a given community feel that they want to adhere to those standards. Um, if everyone else in the Commonwealth were a green community, then I would probably say, give more credence to what you're suggesting, but that's not the case, and I would, I would suggest that it's a choice of the, of the people of the town. And, and then one more question, Mr. Moderator, and then I'll sit down. Um, yeah. Um, it, will we, it wasn't clear, at least for me, or would we lose grant money by going, I'll call it backwards. Yes, definitely yes, because we will no longer be able to apply for green community grant funding. Okay. I make a most, um, I'm done with my questions. I'd like to make a motion to. Can you hold on that motion, please? I'd like to have Ms. Perrine, who's been standing in line patiently. Sorry, sorry, Ms. 
Selectman Perrine. Ruth Perrine, 15 Lufkin Street. So I support rescinding the stretch energy code. I think that the stretch energy code made a lot of sense when we first adopted it. Um, it was the intent of this was for better insulation, more efficient homes. As we move forward, it's going to make uh, new construction more onerous, much more expensive. We're going to be required to put um, electric ch car charging stations in garages, things like that. What we're going to find is that when we have to implement more use of electricity, we're going to find, um, so I have some documents here that we receive as town officials, one of which is titled Rolling Brownouts and Blackouts. This was provided to the town administrator um, back in December of 22, to the chief of police, to the fire chief, and to the board of health administrator. And it's a notification to us about how the grid is going to handle the, um, the restraints of our, our grid system and how they're going to get, uh, they're going to shut down sections of the grid to be able to accommodate things like hospitals. That was pretty alarming to all of us in public safety that we all started freaking out going, oh my God, how do we deal with this? How do we let our residents know that we're going to be doing shutdowns? That's a problem. And as we move forward with new construction, it's going to be a much bigger problem. Um, I think that one of the other documents I have here in my hand, it just actually happened back on April 17th. It was a meeting with Hamilton, Rockport, Topsfield, um, Boxford, Essex, Gloucester, Wenham, Hamilton, Ipswich. And it was put on... So one of the sentences I read, it says, let's talk about the list of economic impacts that are going to result from the, the insufficient electri electricity capacity. So as we're forced to do these things with the stretch energy code, it's going to impact these um, more drastically. The other piece, I was glad when Annie mentioned the grant funding, the Green Communities Grant. So I was going to speak before we asked Brendan to speak. We have pretty much exhausted most of the green energy grants that we could get. One of my big concerns is that one of the things that will be coming down the pike, and it hasn't hit us yet, but as being a green community, we have been looking at the possibility of in the future, it's not at our back door yet, but I am concerned about it, is electric police vehicles and fire vehicles. I don't think anyone in public safety is excited about that, and I, do, can, I can tell you that they are double and triple the cost. So those are things that we're going to be forced into if we continue to maintain stretch energy. So I encourage you to vote yes to rescind. Ada, Ruth, point of order. Ruth? One, one second. Ruth, has the select board addressed the question of Article 20 and rescinding the stretch energy code? This was a citizen's petition. It was, not, it was um, brought to us from the citizen at the select board. The select board decided not to take any action at that time because the citizen who did the petition already had the sufficient signature, so we didn't think we needed to take action. Okay. Ms. O'Donnell, where did you go? Lisa? Oh, there you are. Can you come up here, please? Has the planning board addressed the question of rescinding the stretch energy code? Has the planning board discussed rescinding the stretch energy code? We have not. Okay. We don't, we don't enforce the building code. We enforce the zoning bylaw. The building inspector enforces the building code. Got it. Thank you. Sorry, Ed. Um, thank you for giving me the speech. Mr. Renzi first got up and moved the question. And then he not only had comments, but he entered into a round robin with the town administrator and you. And uh, when you move the question, you're not allowed to debate. And so you're changing things kind of screwed him up a little bit. But he, the, the, the system he, was out of, out of whack. He, he, he did not move the question. He said, moved, I make a motion, he, we postpone this. He moved to initially, he moved to indefinitely postpone and then withdrew the motion and asked the questions first. Okay. I don't have a question. I was the initial proposer. Yep. And I just wanted to make clear, <clears throat> when this passed and for five years, six years, I did, paid no attention to it until I read in the newspaper that they were expanding the extent of the stretch energy code. And so I looked into it and it's crazy. It, if, if you, <clears throat> it used to be it, you had to have a major renovation to your house to qualify. Now I'm reading that the things that are in the pipeline to come to us is anything that requires a building permit is going to trigger these things. 
Uh, if you want to do this stuff on your own, that's, that's fine. That's your business, how, what you do with your property and your house and how much you pay for, for power. But these things are only going to get worse. They're, 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 the way that we adopted this as a bylaw, that as it may be a, in, amended from time to time, anything that the legislature decides to do will come right to us, and our building inspector is going to be uh, expected to become an expert on all of the, the... And I'm telling you, this thing is unbelievably thick. I couldn't figure it all out, but I can tell you, here's a simple explanation. You won't be able to just buy windows that say that they meet this standard. That's not going to be good enough. You're going to have to hire a consultant that comes in, looks your whole property over, and writes a report and certifies that it meets the standard of performance by the, dictated by the state and the code. This is going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be delays. There's no need of it. And so please, you know, and, and that's just what they've agreed they want to do now. So we got no way of knowing what's coming down the road in, in a five years or whatever. They want to go to zero emissions in what? 10, 15 years. You know, a lot of people got brand new boilers and they're not going to be wanting to have them torn out and put in electric power and that's what we could get into with this. So please vote yes on this article. That's the vote to get rid of the stretch energy code. Thank you. Ms. Burnham. Don Burnham, 22 County Road. Five years ago when we voted this in, Stu Pratt, who has been the president of Caldwell Banker International, stood up and said back then that it would add at least 25% to your cost to build a new home. And with these new restrictions, it's going to be a lot more than that. So I would sincerely ask you to vote to rescind this. Any further discussion? Right. There is currently no motion pending other than for the article. So all those in favor of Article 20, hold up your card and say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. Ayes carry it. Motion passes. Article 21. I, Jody Harris, move the town vote pursuant to general law, chapter 64G, subsection 3A, to increase local excise upon the transfer of occupancy of a room in a bed and breakfast establishment, hotel, lodging house, short-term rental, or motel located within the town from 4% to 6%. Having been seconded, any discussion? Mr. Renzi? 86 Southern, just a quick question for Brendan. Um, how do boarding houses fit into this, given the latest debacle in boarding houses in Essex? Hold on, oh, please go back to the microphone. The question comes to me in the first instance, but in the second instance, stay still so we can hear it through the microphone. Thank you. I'm just, my, the question is, how do boarding houses factor into this? My understanding is that they're illegal. If they're not, does that need to get factored into this? And there's been some issues in town about illegal boarding houses. Thank you. It's fine. Okay, the question is how boarding houses fit into this. So generally, and I'm going to defer to town council on this, generally the hotel motel tax which can be up to 6%, but in Essex is only at 4% presently, applies to everything that's lodging-based that has to pay tax. But a boarding house could be a different animal, and maybe town council could address that. I don't know. Would town council please address the question as to boarding houses? Yes. Uh, thank you to you, Mr. Moderator. So the, the general laws refer to it as a a lodging house, which is a um, 
a facility that is rented to not less than four people um, who are not um, related to each other. And usually it's defined as you're renting out a room without a bathroom and a kitchen. Those are common facilities. And so this statute does apply to um, hotels, motels, short-term rentals, and lodging houses. However, this is a tax statute. So um, the, what you're voting on tonight is to decide whether or not to increase the percentage of tax that you would collect on these facilities. If these, any particular facility is not allowed under the town's zoning bylaws, the increase in this tax does not make them allowed. It just means that if they're allowed, you can assess this additional tax on them. Thank you. Mr. Agaloff. Cliff Agaloff, 44 Addison Street. If uh, somebody were to put their house on uh, Airbnb or, or uh, any of the uh, app-based short-term rentals, would the tax apply to them? Mr. It already does. Thank you. Elizabeth Eaton, 17 Spring Street. Does this just for places that want to do this, or will this affect those already in the work? Will it all go up to 6%? Brandy? Those that exist today will go to 6%, and anyone in the future will go to 6%. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Say aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Article 22. Ms. Harris. By Jody Harris, move the town vote to accept the provisions of Section 3D, Subsection A of Chapter 64G in the general laws, allowing the town to impose a community impact fee of not more than 3% of the total amount of rent upon each transfer of occupancy of a professionally managed short-term rental unit, which shall be assessed upon the transfer of one or two or more short-term rental units that are located in the same city or town, operated by the same operator, and are not located within a single-family, two-family, or three-family dwelling that includes the operator's primary residence and which surcharge shall be in addition to other state and local excise taxes assessed upon the transfer of short-term rental units. Thank you. Any second? second. Having been seconded, any discussion? Teresa Whitman, 8 Lufkin Street. Can you just uh, define professionally managed for me how that's being interpreted here. Brendan? Mr. Moderator. Um, through you, can Mr. I answer Gorba. that question? Um, thank you. Um, so with respect to short-term rentals, the, um, the statute distinguishes between those that are professionally managed and those that are not. Um, a unit that is professionally managed or is one that is part of um, at least two units that are owned by the same individual um, that are not within um, a single family dwelling um, that includes the operator's primary residence. So basically, if you're someone who rents out several units throughout the town and you don't live in any of those buildings, then that would be considered a professionally managed building. Um, and, and what you'll see is this article is um, to impose a surcharge on those professionally managed units if this is, is approved, the next article would propose the same surcharge on the rest of the short-term rentals that are not professionally managed. Thank you. Yes. Brendan? Mr. Moderator, I'm just verifying with town council that the motion that was read has a percentage certain in it. I believe it says not more than, and it may be appropriate to amend the motion to make sure that we fix the amount of, of the uh, impact fee to it 
to an exact number, not something that could be on a sliding scale. Town Council is looking at that now. Uh, yes, th through you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I think that was a, a typographical error that was missed in carrying over the Warren article to the motion. The motion should set forth a specific percentage of surcharge up to 3%. So uh, I would recommend if someone is so inclined to make a motion to amend um, to remove the words um, of not more. So she could amend her own motion. Yes. yes, anybody can make a motion to amend. Yes, and I can tell you that the selectmen, when this was discussed, they are in favor of the full 3%. I'll take a motion to amend. Well, someone has to make the motion first. Are you going to make it? Well, she's going to make the motion first, and then, so, I just want to get, hold on, I want to clarify the record here. Are you making a motion to amend your motion? Okay. Oh, got it. Let's do this again because I really liked reading it the first time. I, Jody Harris, move the town vote to accept the provisions of section 3D, subsection A. Mr. Moderator, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but um, this is a motion. The, the motion to amend would just simply be if you are so inclined, I move to amend the motion under Article 20 to delete the words not more than. I, Jody Harris, Move to amend. Move to amend the motion. Under Article 20. Un under Article 20. 22. 22. 22. I'm sorry. 22. To remove the words not more than. To remove the words not more than. We have a second. Any discussion? Is everybody clear as to what the article now says? What the motion, excuse me, says? All right. The motion to amend now says. Jody Harris has moved that the town vote to accept the provision of Section 3DA of Chapter 64G of the General Laws, allowing the town to impose a community impact fee of not more than, excuse me, of 3%, of 3% of the total amount of rent upon each transfer of occupancy of a professionally managed short-term rental unit, which shall be assessed upon the transfer of one of two or more short-term rental units that are located in the same city or town, operated by the same operator, and are not located within a single family, two family, or three family dwelling that includes the operator's primary residence and which surcharge shall be in addition to other state and local excise taxes assessed upon the transfer of short-term rental units. Uh, yes. Mr. Moderator, sorry, so the first thing we need to do is Move to vote motion to amend. on the amendment. Right. Yep. So the motion right now is simply as to whether the motion carries as to amendment of the article. This is not the vote on the actual article. Do you have a question? I have a question before we vote on the article. You're, what are you voting to amend it first and then we can ask a question? Is that it? Okay, that's a point of order. And the question is are we voting on the motion to amend or are we voting on the article? Correct? No, my, my question is when can I make a comment or like on the amended article? Not yet. Right now the question is simply on the motion to amend. If it passes, then we will have debate on discussion on the article as amended. Right now it's just on the motion. Okay. All right. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now, back to the amended article. Any discussion? Yes, I have a question. Um, Elizabeth Eaton, 17 Spring Street. So are Article 21 and 22 connected, which means now 
if someone has such an enterprise, they'll be paying 9 percent? Brennan? As it stands now, uh, whether it's a hotel, motel, lodging house, or short-term rental, with the vote that just occurred, everyone's at 6 percent. If the next piece of this passes, then correct, that subgroup of short-term rentals would be at 9 percent. Then it's going to take the second article on this topic to address the other category of short-term rentals, and that's required by state law, the way the Department of Revenue has these adopted. That's why they're in two separate places, two articles. Just to follow up, my concern is jacking up these percentages. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we are now voting, voting on Article 22 as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? No. Too close to call, so we're going to count this one. Tellers, you spring into action, please. Okay. I'm going to ask everyone to please stay seated. If you are voting, please be seated. I think everyone is. We're going to count by eyes. Just hold, all you have to do is hold up your hands. I can, I'm sorry. Please come to, if you have a question, please come to a... Right. These are votes in favor of the motion to approve the article. And please keep your hands up until the tellers are finished. section, put your hands down, and you guys can finally put your hands down. Thank you. Okay, all those opposed, please put your hands up now. He's already finished.
Okay, you may put your hands down. Thanks. We have 67 in favor and 76 opposed, so the motion fails. All right. I will take a motion to indefinitely postpone Article 23. Indefinitely postpone Article 23. Any discussion? You have to write the motion. This is the article. Any discussion? Just so people understand, Article 23 required Article 22 to pass in order for it to be effective. All right. All those in favor, indefinitely postponing Article 23, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion, car whoop. motion carries. Article 24, Ms. Preen. I, Ruth R. Pre, move that the town vote to authorize the selectmen to enter into a contract or contracts for solid waste hauling services, recycling collection, and or hauling services, transfer station management services, solid waste disposal services, or anything incidental or related thereto for term or terms of up to 10 years. Do we have a second? Discussion? So the Board of Selectmen has the ability to um, sign into contracts that are three years or less. And at this time, we have a uh, solid waste hauling contractor that is interested in giving us a longer-term contract that would give us more preferential rates. So we're interested in being able to sign a, a longer contract just for that specific uh, reason. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Article 25. Mr. Ellis. Paul Rulo, DPW, Ch Chairman, 15 Low Hill Road. I, Paul Rulo, move that the town vote to revise the fee for a transfer station sticker from $250 to $150 for those under the age of 65, and from $125 to $75 for those 65 years of age and older with the fee for a second sticker within a given household remaining at zero dollars, and further to establish a per bag fee of two dollars and fifty cents for the purchase of a small trash bag, 15 gallons, and a per bag fee of four dollars and seventy-five cents for the purchase of a large trash bag, 33 gallons, to be accepted as part of the town's new pay-as-you-throw solid waste disposal program, all said fees to be effective for stickers and bags purchased for the period beginning July 1st, 2023. We have a second? Discussion. At the, uh, at the fall town meeting, we came with an interim trash fee of $250, that was because our long-term contract that we had expired. We had a, um, we had a tremendous deal with, a, uh, with the vendor, which, um, which unfortunately expired at the end of the last calendar year. 
So in this last six month interim period, we've been going over alternatives, trying to figure out the best way, the most equitable way to pay for the cost of solid waste. And we've come up with pay as you throw. I know it's not popular, but seeing our last contract that we had that was very favorable to the town, it cost us cost us $180,000 for a year. So, unfortunately, the cost is going to more than double. We've looked at the best way we can to reduce the cost, to come up with something that's, that's equitable and, and fair and, and really the least cost of everything. All, the, the alternative we came up with was pay as you throw. I... I um, Personally, prefer to keep it the way it is, but when the cost was $177,000 for a year, we received numerous comments and complaints of saying, you know, I, I just have a small amount of trash and I see people throwing all this stuff in there in the hopper and it's like, it's not equitable. So, so over the last six months, we've been working, trying to get proposals, information from the, from the industry that we've come up with pay as you throw. From an economic standpoint, you know, there was a, uh, there was a handout that came in. There are two notable items on this. One, town of Essex, we have a little pocket, you know, we have a high, high amount of trash per, per household. You know, that all costs money. We pay Every ton we throw away costs us more money. It's not a, it's not a lump sum. It's not a lump sum item. We we have a tonnage cost for, for our disposal of solid waste. The other notable item on, on this um, handout is on the upper right hand corner is there's a pay as you throw average of twelve hundred and forty seven pounds per household per year. That's a Pay as you throw. That's a, that's a standard that the uh, state's been using, and non-pay as you throw average, which which is what we currently use practice, is 1,757 pounds per household per year. So, going from the current practice to pay as you throw, we're going to reduce the amount of tonnage by approximately a third. So, obviously, from an economic standpoint, it's, it's going to be a lot cheaper if you go with the pay as you throw. And as far as equity goes, again, we've had a lot of comments when the, when the cost was inexpensive at $177,000 that, hey, you know, I'm, I just have a small amount of trash and I'm paying a lot, I'm paying the same amount as people who throw in a lot into the hopper. So for those two reasons, economics and equity, you know, the DPW board has uh, decided to move the pay as you throw program forward. You know, that's for this coming count fiscal year. We still have the transfer station. We don't have a good handle on how much trash we're going to get, how much, how much uh, we should charge per bag and, and for the sticker. Through this current, next fiscal year, through the practice, monitor it for the year, we can come back and, and possibly fine-tune the numbers. And we still have the transfer station. If we don't like the pay-as-you-throw system, we can always revert back to the current practice. Thank you. We have a second. Yeah. Stan Hilton, 25, John Wyzab. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. One of them, the fee that you just uh, stated, uh, in the past, it used to be good for a year. The last go around, it was six months. What's the duration? The, the, the last stick was six months. Right. And that, there was, a, there was an administrative reason for that. That was a $250 one-time fee. Our last solid waste transfer station ended on, a, uh, on the calendar year. So we did that at six-month extension so we could bring in the, the new contract into a fiscal year into a fiscal year uh, t cycle to match up with, with, with town meeting and, and the town budget. Okay, and the other thing for bulk items, does that remain intact, the fees? Good point. Bulk items fees have not will not change under this article. Okay, thank you. 
Angus Bruce, 51 Pine Street. Um, just a point, uh, a question. So you gave amounts for old guys like me get to pay, um, but it doesn't say that in the article. So does that make any difference? Because the article states it's to some other amount. In other words, it doesn't state a specific amount, but you, Sir, you I'm gave. Not, I'm not sure what, what you're reading, what it references. Uh, I, I yeah. can't answer that. Stop for a minute. Mr. Zabricki? When the warrant was put together, we were still in the process of finalizing contracts for July 1, 2023 forward. So there was no way of knowing what the amounts would be until we got to the motion, which has now been read. Okay, so by him mentioning it then, that qualifies the number? The motion, oh, yes, it could be in the motion. Right. The, the motion governs what is before the town. Okay. Um, and then a question on the, on the bagging. Is that also recycle or just the bulk? The uh, cost of the bags is for solid waste. It's just so, solid. All right. Thank you. Look, I go off 44 Addison Street. Um, I think the question might have already been asked, but I wasn't sure I got the answer. Do we have any projection what the, what the bag fees will be? We do. In, in the article, Cliff, the, the bag fees will be $4.75 for a large bag, which is 33 gallons, and a uh, small bag, which is 15 gallons, will be $2.50. Scott Solombrino, 25 County Road. Um, I spoke on this at the last meeting that we had, and I have multiple reasons why I think this is a very bad idea. If you talk to people who live in Ipswich and Hamilton, of which I have family and many friends in both towns, they have lists of issues. Their first issue is the bags at the local stores are not available because the local stores don't get paid for debit card fees or credit card fees. And it becomes really difficult sometimes to find bags, especially in Ipswich. The second issue is that when people have to pay for trash, if you talk to people in places like Gloucester, they start doing different things with trash other than going to the dump with it because they're paying per bag. The last thing I'd like to say is that one of the things that makes Essex unique as a community from Hamilton or Ipswich, of which I've lived in Hamilton, is that we have a town dump and we have freedom. If you want to go take a bureau and you put it in the dump, you go take a bureau and put it in the dump and you pay a fee to do that. If you want to take 10 bags of trash, you take 10 bags of trash. If you want to take one bag, you take one bag of trash. If you have five kids in your family, you might have more trash than a person who only has one person living in their house. This is an additional tax. We already pay taxes as homeowners. I don't like the fact that this is another way to tax the community. And I think that once this gets installed, anybody who believes for one second in this room that it will ever get reversed, it's not going to happen. This is a misguided way to deal with it. If anything, just raise the fee back to the 250. And everybody's paying the same, and everybody's equal, and that's how you deal with trash. Like, Mr. Zubricki, I'm asking Mr. Zubricki to comment on whether this is a tax. Just a point of clarification, this is not a tax. This is a fee. A fee. There's a difference, folks. There's a difference, folks. A fee is something that the town goes and calculates what its cost is going to be and splits that up, and the town is not allowed to go beyond what the cost is going to be. A tax is actually done on a, on a much more arbitrary scale than, than a fee. Uh, Tom DeMeo, 35 Water Street. Um, a bag fee is a transactionally inefficient thing to do. It puts an overhead on every transaction. It's inefficient. It makes things harder for everybody. Everybody has to do a little bit more work to throw away their trash. And if you do a little bit of you know, back of the envelope calculations here, it sounds like you're going to create a cash flow that would, would have paid for the doubling of the, the contract. 
if you do that math that you put out there with the 1,200 and whatever pounds of trash and you divide it by the number of bags that people will have to buy, it's going to cover the difference. I don't understand what the point of this is. Why not just pay the money and make this efficient? It's a much more efficient system to not make everybody pay transactionally for every bag. It's expensive. Well, we do think... Mr. Zubricki, hold on a minute. So, you know, the, the questions raised, you know, why can't you just pay one fee, right, and continue to throw as much as you want in there? Remember what Mr. Rulo said. The town had a very favorable contract that was at like $67 a ton, and that included the transport of the solid waste from our transfer station to the plant in Haverhill where, where it's incinerated. That's a crazy good deal, okay? And the only reason that the town had that deal for 10 years is because in the previous 10 years, there were some questionable billing practices of the place where the waste was going, and rather than um, get involved in litigation with the town, we got another 10-year deal at a favorable rate, including the hauling. Um, if you're going to have an unlimited amount of trash going into the hopper the way it is today, with a fee that went from $67 to almost $94, and a separate contract for hauling per ton, you're going to soon find out that we're not going to be able to afford it. It's only because there was such a good deal in the past that included the hauling that the town was able to put that much trash in the hopper and still afford it for a reasonable fee. John Bedeese, Rocky Hill Road. Can you define what bulk, what a bulk in the bin is? Mr. Wheeler, can you? Bulk items are typically used for, for chairs, mattresses, items that, that uh... But we, we pay for, Mr. Moderator? Yes. We pay for those individually now anyhow. So we would continue to pay for that? For Mr. bulk? Wheeler? The answer is yes, through the, through the current stick system for the bulk item. Eddie? I don't understand this debate. Uh, we put the system in 30-something years ago. It's worked well for the town. You bought a sticker. Were there inequities? Are there inequities? Sure. Just like the, some people pay to have children in the school that don't have kids in the school. Some people could generate more trash than others. Um, they banned commercial trash. This doesn't affect me. I've had a dumpster since Bill Perkins stood up and said, no more commercial trash at the dump. So all my stuff goes into the $100 a month dumpster. But the system worked, we didn't have trash on the street, and I think the false premise here is that by doing it by the bag, that there's going to be less trash. And I think that the, we know how much trash gets generated in Essex, and turn, putting it in bags is not going to diminish that. It's just that, as Mr. Salambrino pointed out, where are the bags going? And I don't want to see them down Rocky Hill Road or the end of Island Road or wherever, that's what happens. So I think we should just, it should be div divided back up, whatever the sticker fee is. I think the town has some cushion that we give the finance committee some money in case we run short. And just go back to the, whatever it is to pay a sticker to pay the bill, just keep the same system that we've always had that works so well. Just because the contract ran out, I don't know, understand why we had to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Uh, just one second comment. There, there's some, some statements being made, but there's not a lot of math here. I really would like to see the math. I mean, you've got the total in terms of weight that you expect us to throw away under the two scenarios. You've got the, the fees, but you could have done some math here and shown us, and you didn't. Well, math is that we'll reduce our solid waste by one-third, and we won't have to... Re Excuse me. Please, comments come to the moderator. Well, there's a reason for it, so it doesn't devolve into yelling back and forth. 
Mr. Rule, do you want to respond? Yeah. The, the math comes down to reducing the solid waste by one third. You reduce. We're going to start to have to pay for the hauling fees, which is approximately $1,200 per truck in our solid waste fees. I don't have the tonnage fee, but it's, it's going to go up dramatically. So regardless, through the state practice, the solid waste will go down one third. So from an economic standpoint, is, uh, there, there absolutely is less cost for pay as you throw. You don't have to. No. Okay. I'm sorry, Annie, I think you were next. Hi, Annie, Cam Annie Cameron Pickering Street. I have a little comment and then a question for Paul, if I could. I have sometimes spent several hours at the dump just, you know, watching people. And I often notice, that's because I'm there to ask, answer questions. I don't hang out at the dump, but... Um, yes, you do. I do. Um, I noticed sometimes that there are folks who may be contractors who use the facilities, and I know that that's not allowed, and I know, Ed, that you are ethical about that, and you don't do it, but I'm just wondering, have you done any studies on how many folks are using it for not personal use? Maybe I'm making a generalization, I don't know, but I'm wondering if the bags will afford us an opportunity to kind of see what's the true, the true uh, weight of our trash. And then I always think about the, you know, insurance negotiations when you have, you know, a better year. You know, if you have a good year and we'd reduce the trash, will it give us a better, would it put us in a better negotiating position? So I don't have a position on this. I just wondered if you could tell us what you've seen. Well, we, we see some, some abuse at the transfer station. And if the, the, the uh, trash from out of town does arrive in a bag, at least we're getting, generating Paul, it'd be the microphone, please. Thank you. Well, we have noticed and we expect that there's a lot of solid waste being disposed of that comes from out of town. You can see that on the, on the figure. We have a, we, we have, we're in a little island of a, a lot of tonnage generated in town. So we expect that even though solid waste is being brought into town, from outside of Essex, at least if it comes in a bag, somebody has to pay for that bag, and we're going to generate some revenue out of it. Sorry. Hi, my name is Shelley Bradbury at 79 Eastern Ave. Um, I've been interested in this from the beginning, and I have gone to the BOS meetings, the DPW. I do have to say that the DBW has gone round and round and round, coming up for solutions, coming out with numbers, going back. I mean, I commend you, because it's been very difficult to come up with a solution. Um, there has been a lot of abuse at the trash transfer station, and the fact that we have so much trash as a small community is astounding, because I watch everyone throw... A, Sorry, a lot of people throw it into the compactor. When recycling is free, free, okay? So I recycle most of my stuff and have a 15, half bag of a 15 gallon bag. We have to control our tonnage. That's what we're paying for. This is to reduce that. And so by getting, paying for your bag of what you produce, will give DPW a better idea of what the amount of trash will be. And I can guarantee it, if you use recycling, your ton the tonnage is going to go down. So I fully support this, and I thank the DPW for all of you've done. Because when they looked at the pickup service, it was three times the amount, and none of us could afford it. This is the best solution. Alvin Gajero, Martin Street. Um, as a single person in town, I, I appreciate this because if, you, if I had to pay $500 a year, yeah, I probably would be dropping a bag somewhere in a street corner because that's a lot for somebody to have to pay 
and I'm assuming it's going to be even more than 500 if we did continue. The other thing is, I'm one of those nosy neighbors, and I watch every truck that goes by. And when I see the same truck go by on a Saturday for the third time, I go, that's a lot of trash that one truck's doing. So I see it. I haven't taken down the license plate yet, because then that would just make me that neighbor. But thank you for taking the time. I, I feel the bag solution is the best for those with smaller families and um, the seniors. Thank you. Jody Harris, 21 Hour Spring Street. I, I know that the numbers have been crunched. I've seen spreadsheets and recalculations. Um, how much would the sticker cost if we did not have pay as you throw? It's my first question. My second comment to Shelley's uh, comment, recycling is not free, but it, is, it will feel free to you with the pay as you throw and will reduce what we are hauling away and um, they're taking because there are two fees, two components. And the third is, if this doesn't pass, does the town of Essex have to provide trash removal services at all? Okay. Uh, Mr. Rule, can you start with the first question? Yeah, sure. Question one, how much would it cost if we stayed at the current system? Well, we, we, we had a system for six months at $250. We feel that that wasn't enough. We don't have the price to come back for an entire year, but that number would be exceed $500 per year if we stayed with the current system. There was a second question. Second question. And I think actually it's probably really for Brendan. So uh, just, in, just to follow up on the cost, I agree it will exceed $500. Town accountants working on a number right now. It's important for everyone to understand that if the meeting doesn't favor pay as you throw, it would be still behoove the meeting to come up with the fee for the sticker, albeit a much higher fee. Otherwise, the town will not be able to pay a contractor for anything, right? Because you have to have the revenue one way or the other. Now, the qu another question was posed as to whether the town has to provide solid waste or recycling services. The answer is no, and in fact, the town of Rowley does not. I don't know if there are other questions. No, that was it. You're next. Uh, re re request to make a motion. Request to make a motion. And John motion. Andrusovich, Forest Avenue. And your, your motion is? To postpone until we have an alternative plan, knowing the exact price for an alternative uh, throw as you will, uh, throw as much as you wish sticker price. Write it up, please. Okay. I need it written. I believe it's a motion to indefinitely postpone, but it's going to take a moment. I'm up for the regular order.
Okay, the motion. Okay, what I can't read is your last name very well. Androsevich, got it. I got half of it right, but the, the Vich I missed, okay. Mr. Androsevich's motion is to indefinitely postpone Article 25 until an alternative plan is priced for unlimited dumping. Do we have a second? Discussion. Jody. Hello. Okay. Okay. One at a time, please. Who's in line? Okay. I'm going to ask Mr. Soulard to address the numbers that would be impacted by the motion. If we are to switch from the combined sticker and pay-as-you-throw system that was proposed um, to absorb the cost of the transfer station, it would be it, five, it, over $500 per person if we didn't have the senior discount. If we work in the senior discount, you are looking at roughly $700 for under 65, and you are looking at $350 for seniors over the age of 65. Thank you, Mr. Schuller. The motion again is to indefinitely postpone Article 25 until an alternate plan is priced for unlimited dumping. So, point of order. Point of order, Mr. Zabricki. Important to understand that a motion to indefinitely postpone this article, if it carries, means there will be no uh, revenue for the transfer station, which means effectively the transfer station would shut down. So, when you're considering whether you want to indefinitely postpone, you need, to, you need to determine whether you want to continue debating the merits of pay-as-you-throw versus just a, a one sticker. But what's before you right now, and it's fine, you can vote for it if you want, is something that would um, prevent the town from collecting revenue. Uh, town Council, um, do you have any other thing to say about the motion? Because it has kind of two components to it. But the indefinitely postpone is the part that would cause a problem. Through you, Ms. Through you, Ms. Moderator. Please respond. Um, thank you. So I, I heard two parts to the motion. It was to indefinitely postpone until some other plan is developed. And so just to make it clear, um, you can indefinitely postpone that, which is, has the effect of a no vote um, and takes it from the table. But um, a direction that there be a plan um, is really just a non-binding advisory at that point, it would be up to the select board to decide when and under what circumstances to bring it back. Thank you. All right. I th Ed, why don't you go first? I'm going to work my way around the room. Who am I stepping on? I, I don't think we should indefinitely postpone. If we don't, then I would make a motion that we institute a flat fee of $300 until such time as the plan, the uh, super selectmen and the and the DPW can get together, and, and in the fall town, that should be enough maybe to get us to the fall town meeting when we can have an exact number and charge it then. Okay, so I just want to understand: you are making a motion, or you're suggesting? Well, I, that I don't motion... think I can make a motion until we vote not to indefinitely postpone. Mr. Zubricki. So if a flat fee is developed and it's not enough money, the selectmen can't actually go through with the contracts that are pending because contracts cannot be signed by the selectmen unless there's an adequate appropriation. You would actually need another town meeting vote to get to whatever that magic number was in order for the contracts to go in place. And from July 1 all the way till November town meeting, there would be a gray area as to whether we had enough money to actually give you trash services during that time. Ms. Cameron. Hi, Annie Cameron Pickering. I would ask you to not leave this meeting and not solve the problem. I think we need to solve it tonight. And I also, just, just from, um, you know, the exchange that Paul and I had, I think there's a lot of people using this dump that probably shouldn't be using it. And I think that the bag system would give us some sort of a proof of concept to see what's the true trash 
production in this town and how can we best pay it? And also, I wonder, you didn't ha have a chance to answer the question, but if we produce less, would we be in a better negotiating position? Um, if we produce less, it costs less. What you mean by a better negotiation system, I, I don't... Produce less trash. Wait a minute. Annie, please direct the question. The question is, what is your question? My question is, if we produce less trash in this proof of concept period, would it put us in a better negotiating position for the next year? Because you said this is only one year, correct? That's a select board, right? Ten. Um, that's actually a select board issue. So... Mr. Fippen, do you want to do it? Mr. Z Brennan is going to do it. So we're looking at um, a couple of three-year contracts, one with the company that does the distribution of the bags to the stores, one that um, for three years, which is the disposal at Covanter and Haverhill, and then a five-year contract for the hauling services. So if the town meeting generates a high enough appropriation tonight, those contracts, which are all subject to appropriation, can begin on July 1. Okay. If not, then they can't. Um, does that help answer your question, or do you have other? It does. Okay. And I'm going to move away. Thank you. Lisa? Lisa O'Donnell, uh, 15 Island Road, half a... Uh, 15 gallon bag a week person. Um, if you guys picked up this map when you walked in, it's really informative because Essex is this bright red dot on Cape Ann and none of our neighbors even produce half the trash per person that we do. This is absurd. This means that there's a lot of trash happening that is not residential trash and we're all paying for it. So the bags will stop that. I don't, I don't understand where the complication with that is. It's very clear that when you pay as you throw, you're paying for what you throw out, and we won't be a red dot anymore. Thank you. Janet Carlson, 24 Apple Street. I want to recommend not postponing um, this motion. I've attended quite a few Board of Selectmen meetings in the past months, and... They have had so many conversations with the DPW to work on this challenge. They have looked at every possible solution, and I support pay-as-you-go. I think we should throw out less, recycle more. It's a little painful to some people who might not want to pay a little bit more for their trash, but it's equitable for people, of one, one person in a household versus six. And if it makes you think about what you're throwing away and recycle more, hooray for us. Thank you. Teresa Whitman, 8 Lufkin Street. Um, so I have a question about the contracts that um, uh, town administrator just uh, mentioned, and I'm wondering, uh, I too have also attended the uh, Board of Selectmen meetings, that there has been a lot of conversation about this, a lot of different opportunities and different um, strategies discussed and gone through, and I understand that this is the one that, that you believe is the right one. But clearly there are some townsfolk who are having a hard time with that. Regarding those three contracts, the contract for the distribution of the bags, is there an opportunity for a shorter contract for the distribution of bags or another way of going about attaining them so that we can do a test run? Sometimes it helps to get through, get through six months or one year of something, even just six months and reevaluate in the fall to take a look at how this actually feels and plays out. One thing I did hear um, at the Senior Center uh, last week with the Q&A was that if we find that, that the, uh, the, this is intended to be budget neutral, so that if we find that we're making more money than we're expending in the hauling fees and such, that the sticker price could potentially be reduced. So I want to know if we can do a test run of this rather than a three-year contract on the bags because we're going to need hauling and, and you know, those other two contracts either way. Please. Okay. Brendan, it's a contract issue. So the terms that the selectmen have entered into, subject to appropriation by the town meeting, would be for three years. I would have to look through the contract to determine what 
uh, opportunity the town would have to get out of the contract earlier than that to answer the question, which I will do. I believe I have a, with, a copy with me, okay. but it's going to take me a minute, so maybe you want to keep taking. We can do that. Brendan. Brendan, oh. I also believe the other portion to the answer to that question is that we'll know what the costs are, and if we enter into a long-term agreement, a three-year contract agreement with a vendor, we're still able to annually adjust the cost of the stickers, and we're able to adjust the cost of the bags. Right, you can adjust? Okay. Yes. The motion is not to simply and definitely postpone. The motion was to indefinitely postpone until such time as an alternative plan can be put forth, which opens up the question as to contract issues and alternative plans. You're right. A simple motion, we would not be having this discussion. Okay, thank you. I think you're next. Hi. Um, just a little bit more about the math, because that's what's worrying me. If we take you at your word on the study that you proposed and people throw away, instead of, what was it, almost 1,800 pounds down to 1,200 something, you're still looking, and, and we just got the numbers on the, the Holloway fees, I don't see how you're going to get from 700 down, what are you going to get from 700 down to? It still sounds like you're probably going to have to spend five, six hundred thousand to, to, I mean, five or six hundred dollars per citizen to do the same thing, even if we use the bags. I don't see how this adds up mathematically. There's no way a 475 fee is going to cover this. Excuse it's me. not going to add Excuse up. Me. The motion is to indefinitely postpone until such time as an alternative plan can be operated. You've already spoken twice on the article. Your comments are to the article. If you have something to say with regard to the alternative plan, Please feel free to use your time. I have that answer. Answer to? Uh, the question about contract length. Yes. So we've read the contract, and the contract says that the town can terminate the pay-as-you-throw bag services uh, uh, within 90 days' notice for any reason. The town would not have to pay a penalty for that, but the town would have to, of course, absorb any bag stock that the vendor has on hand because they're not going to take a bath on it. Okay. Um, Natasha Taylor, 67 Apple Street. I have a comment, a question, and a suggestion. My comment is that just a few months ago, maybe last year, we had businesses stop using plastic bags. They had to get rid of their extra bags by a certain date. And now we're asking homeowners to buy a bag for $5, almost $5. Um, and my comment is, my suggestion is that possibly that we can use a barrel system that's a certain size, that's pre-designated by the town and maybe has a town seal on it that we can all bring to the dump. It would reduce transaction fees and we can continue with our barrel system. And my question is, how would the bag reduce the trash if the contractors can also buy the bags? I'm sorry, could you see that question again and please direct it here? How does the bag purchasing work? Do you have to be a resident of the town to buy a bag? Or can anybody buy a bag? That's outside the scope of the motion. The motion that is pending is to indefinitely postpone the article until such time as an alternate plan is Thank you for unlimited dumping. Thank you. Any more discussion on the motion? One, one final. I just want to thank Teresa Whitman, 8, 8 Lufkin Street. Thank you for the answer. Um, that informs my uh, opinion on not uh, postponing this indefinitely. Um, I believe that since we can cancel that contract at any time for the bags, that it is worth it for the people who feel that um, economically it's going to be helpful to them, um, people with small uh, small families, individuals, um, to give this a try, and let's see how it goes, knowing that we do have the option to cancel that. I'm in support of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. One last. Sure. My name is Fabrice Langlois. I'm at uh, Six Sevens Way. Can you go through the logistics of what it'll mean for somebody that needs to go to the dem at least once a week? 
Because if it's five dollars every bag and you go at least once a week, that's 300 bucks a year plus what you're already paying for. It kind of feels like we're getting close to what it would cost anyway. What's the logistics of filling up this bag and how does that work? Uh, wait, Paul, I'm sorry. The comment is outside the scope of the motion. The motion is to indefinitely postpone until such time as an alternative plan can be created that prices it uh, differently, not how the article itself operates. Ms. Cataldo. Vicky Cataldo, Rocky Hill Road, I move the question. Second. All those in favor of moving the question? All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We are now voting on the motion. Shall we read again? To postpone Article 25 until an alternate plan is priced for unlimited dumping. All those in favor say aye. All those, yeah, hold up your cards, please. All those opposed? Motion fails. So, we are now back to Article 25. Stand up and make a motion. Christopher Wolf, for Saugenies Creek. I move the question. I move the Dr. question, Martin. Mark Second. Renzi. He's Any discussion on moving the question? All those in favor of, aye, of moving the question say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are now going to vote on Article 25. Remember, please hold up your cards. All those in favor of Article 25, I'm going to try that one more time. All those in favor of Article 25, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Motion carries. We now move to Article 27. We dealt with 26 last night. I, Peter D. Fippen, I, Peter D. Fippen, move that the town vote to authorize the Board of Selectmen to enter into a contract for up to five years for the provision of youth summer camp services, youth and adult enrichment services, or anything incidental or related thereto. Do we have a second? second. Thank you. Any discussion? So this is just to renew or to let out a contract for an entity to manage the summer youth camp uh, at, um, at the Grove. Um, the last contractor was the YMCA. Further discussion? Don Burnham, 22 County Road. I'm just curious, does the town get any money for the Y taking over the Grove five days a week? Mr. Zabricki? The town is not directly paid by the YMCA for its use of the Grove. However, the YMCA does provide the town with in-kind services, such as maintenance of the grounds, uh, renovations to some of the buildings. You may have noticed that the, uh, a lot of the buildings got new roofs that was done by the YMCA, the, the labor for it. Um, they have built certain things, and then they've actually helped us from time to time when there's vandalism and a door get, it gets broken down. We call them up and they send in their own, uh, their own uh, forces to deal with it. But no, there's no direct lease amount or direct payment. Annie? Annie, Cameron. Uh, I just want to say that this has been a very, very good um, partnership with the Y. I know that the Y is not specified here as a vendor, but um, they um, offer a good program. They have trained individuals who run it, and they have insurance and all the things that we don't want to pay for out of their own town coffers, but they also want to expand services and they want to work with us on other kind of programming, and I think that it's a really great opportunity that we need to kind of organize ourselves and avail ourselves of, but the Y is a very good partner, and um, it's a great program for our kids. Jay. 
Uh, Jay Tetzloff, 98 Western. Um, easy question. Does the rebuilding of the pavilion have anything at all to do with this question about the YMCA, and do they care that we tore down the old one? Or... Mr. Zubrick? I'm having trouble hearing what the question was. Okay. Um, does rebuilding the, the Folsom Pavilion have anything at all to do with the YMCA's interest in, the, in renewing? It, it does Do not. Um, the, the YMCA did use the Folsom Pavilion that was torn down, yeah. and now that there is none, they actually put up tents during the summer. Would they utilize a new pavilion yeah. that, if it is built, yes, they will. Uh, is there a schedule for that? Do you know? We're hoping to see great progress made by the beginning of the summer. Any further debate? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Ruth, hold on one second. The, look, thank everybody for your concentration and your attention. The town meeting is not supposed to be the Bataan death march. So I'm going to fall on the practice of some of my predecessors. Why don't we just take a second? People want to stand up and stretch for a moment before we move on. I think it'd be a good thing. We've been sitting here for a while. So just for a second. You're earning your keep. What's that? You're earning your keep for your last show. Oh. <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing very well. Well, we have another twist coming. All right, folks. Let's get the show back on the road. Please take, take your seats, everybody. Whoops. All right, Ms. Preen. I, Ruth R. Preen, move to reconsider the vote for the motion on Article 25. Is there a second? All right, any discussion? So I think it's extremely important that we reconsider the motion on Article 25 for the transfer station. We have signed into the contracts. It is absolutely the best um, option. We vetted quite a few of them, and I just want to make sure we lock this down. So I'm hoping that you will vote no on reconsidering Article 25. Any further discussion? Okay, the motion is to reconsider Article 25. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed? No. Motion fails. Thank you. I, Ruth R. Perrine, move that we reconsider Article 22. Is there a second? Any discussion? So the reason I'm asking to reconsider Article 22 is that, as I sit at the table, I'm actually getting quite a few text messages from people in the audience that were very unsure of what this article was actually asking. So I'm standing before you to try to give you a little bit better of an explanation if I can, and I'm not a pro, but I'm going to do the best as I understand it from the meetings that we've been in. So Article 22 is basically an impact fee. What this is is for short-term rentals that it's for short-term rentals for one 
or two or more short-term rental units that are located in the same city or town or operated by the same operator that are not located within a single-family, two-family, or three-family dwelling that includes operator's primary residence, which would be surchargeable. So this is basically a pass-through. When you have a home, let's say you have a four-family, so this doesn't actually impact you until you hit the third rental. So it doesn't kick in until you've rented the third unit. If you have a three-family home, you live in one unit, and you rent out the other two as a short-term rental, it does not impact you. If you move out of that third unit, once you've rented the third unit, it would impact you. These are kind of a pass-through. What happens is if you rent your units on, say, Airbnb or VRBO, you go in, you sign up, you go stay at this rental, and that platform actually pays the DOR, the taxes, the taxes come back to the town. So um, I'm going to read just a kind of a brief thing. According to the DOR, our short-term rental room rate for fiscal year 22 was $21,000 based on the existing 4% rate. That means short-term rental gross revenue was $525,000 for fiscal year 22. Assuming the same gross revenue, we would pick up an additional $10,500 if Article two, uh, 21 passes, and we would increase the rooms rate to 6%, adding another 3% local impact fee, which would add another $15,750. So I guess I'm coming at this from a, a, a revenue point of view. We sat through town meeting last night talking about where's the town going to find revenue. Well, if we don't look at some of these possibilities, it's going to be in taxes because we don't have more land to build more businesses or more homes. And so our only opportunity right now is to increase taxes or to look at creative ways like an impact fee. These are not going to... These are going to be... I think that my way of thinking of this is people that may not live in Essex, let's say they live in Hamilton and they buy homes here in Essex and they're renting them out as Airbnbs. They could be your neighbor and they're just coming and going and an impact fee may mitigate some of the concern that people have with Airbnbs. So I would like you to reconsider, I want you to vote yes to reconsider Article 22. Any further discussion? It was second. Yes. All right. Call to vote. All those in favor of reconsidering, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. No carries. Motion fails, in other words. Ms. Preen, Article 28, please. I, Ruth R. Preen, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $8,000 to purchase a new copy machine for Town Hall. Any discussion, having been seconded? No real discussion. This is one of our capital expenses that we plan for every, is it six years? Every six years, we build it into our capital plan, and we're looking to replace it, and it is in need of replacement. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 29, Mr. Tetzel. I, J. Tetzloff, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $10,000 to retain the services of a consultant or consultants to perform historical property surveys to perform research data collection for said surveys and to perform historical planning work, all to inform and advise the Essex Historical Commission. A um, couple of things about this. Oh. Oh. Any second? Second. Discussion. Now you may Can I speak to it for a Yes, now you Okay. Um, this has been a challenging one to put forward. Uh, the Historical Commission uh, typically has a very small budget. We haven't used any of it for several years, and when we did, uh, we had funded it from community preservation funds. I am informed that that was a mistake in the past, and that's why this is even a separate article at this point. Um, a number of uh, people have challenged why we would even do this, so I've got a, a start of an answer here. Um, it's my fifth anniversary in Essex yesterday, so I have fresh eyes on the town. Uh, I've owned eight different houses in four different states. And I'm here to tell you, you have a very, very special setting here. And it's changing. So why do we need surveys? There's two practical purposes and a more fun purpose. The practical purpose is 
The only standing the Essex Historical Commission has is to administer the town's demolition delay bylaw. Translated, that means if you want to tear one down, you've got to apply for a demolition permit. When those come up, um, I and the commission have the, ta the task of trying to figure out whether that property is historically significant or not. If it is, uh, we sched deemed to be historically significant, we have to schedule a public hearing where we talk about it, and then after that, we have to vote on whether or not to invoke a six-month demolition delay. Basically, delay the teardown by six months so we can document it and try to come up with some way to save it. Um, to my knowledge, we've only done that once uh, on 11 John Wise when we built a public safety building. Uh, that whole process was amicable. We worked with the, um, with the project team to plan that in the timeline, and we ended up saving uh, the framework for uh, a timber frame structure of a very rare design. That sat in the shipyard for a couple of years, and from what I understand now, uh, we've been able to save it uh, by giving it to somebody in Rockport who had the land to re-erect it. That's great. Um, other than that, there is no uh, imposition of any kind that the Historic Commission can impose on anybody. So the idea that this is a, uh, a sneaky way to get to restrictions so we tell you what to do with your house is just simply false. It's not there and it won't be there. Uh, Essex is unique. Um, we learned about one uniqueness earlier in this meeting, but the second one is we don't have historic districts. I won't propose one. Essex is small and the whole thing is historic. There's no sense busying ourselves with more red tape to split it up into small places. I mean, the, the special things we have are sprinkled and uh, uh, not worth further thought that way. Um, the, the, the more fun part is to understand and enjoy where we live. Um, I'm an architecture buff, I could bore you, uh, but I won't. Um, but I can tell you with a couple of residents already, I've helped them appreciate things about their properties that they didn't know and probably wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and uh, many of our properties don't have surveys right now. The immediate uh, downside of that is if a state or federal funded project were to come to us, not of our choosing, and we've said it carefully, if, if, if a project comes to us not of our choosing and it impacts a a historic property, if we have a survey on it, it'll trigger what's called a Section 106 review, where the entity that's proposing the project would have to compensate us in some way or seek to minimize that impact. So there is a practical purpose for this, but in the end, Essex is special. I can tell you why. Uh, no districts, no restrictions, no meddling, no inconvenience. And as far as the commission going forward, we're going to use this to launch kind of an education and outreach program using a, what I'll call a train-the-trainer approach. I hate consultants, I used to be one, so I know. Um, what, what we do is we will find one that will teach us how they do these surveys. It's, it's not rocket science, it's not magic. I've tried to do them myself. I can tell you it's difficult. Uh, it involves some uh, difficult tools and um, is not, not uh, something that the layperson can realistically do. So please vote yes. Any further discussion? Uh, I've been in town, oh, Ed Neal, 15 Western Ave. I've been in town over 50 years. And in, since in the 80s, the, the Historical Commission has periodically, since it was created, come in front of the town asking for more power for, to impact the antique houses that exist in the town. Um, Mr. Tetzloff has been advertising on Facebook about how this is a beneficial thing. We need a survey of these homes. Last night, I presented him with what I downloaded about the town of Essex Antique Homes, 45 pages of pictures of all the antique houses, to explanations of who lived there, who built them, why, and to some degree how they involved. And they go from the 1600s up until the 1800s. <clears throat> the la at la last fall, it was raised this, an article like this at the Fall Town meeting, and I got up and said, we shouldn't subject people that own these old houses to the interference from a historical commission, and having a new survey done that goes and intrusively looks at other people's houses, it's their home, it's not, an, it's not a museum piece, it's their home. And having go and look at these houses w was not, w was an imposition that was unnecessary and repugnant to me. The um, at the time, I said, I think there's a survey out there of all these houses, but I couldn't place it. 
Well, it took me five minutes to go online, plug in Antique Essex Homes, and come up with this very comprehensive, like I say, each page is a different house, 45 pages of an explanation of the antique houses. I don't know why we need to spend $10,000 on another survey. And the, and the claims that, oh, this isn't going to, this doesn't lead to anything. Yes, it does. It's, they get a survey, they get the, some expert from out of town to tell you how significant the house is. Somebody comes and and they want to demolish a part of one of these houses, they get to, right now, they get to, to delay them for six months, which in retrospect was kind of silly for us to approve that because it's, people just get up and all of a sudden one morning and say, I think I'll demolish half of my antique house or all of it. It's somebody going to do that with a lot of careful consideration. So I say vote this down. And it shouldn't keep be coming up in front of the, in front of the town. You know, if it keeps coming up, I think one, I'm going to go around at the dump and get petitions to abolish the historical commission so that we don't have to keep debating this every few years. It's, it, it's, not, it's not proper. And we have a survey right here. When I spoke to Mr. Tesla last night, last night he said, yeah, but that's dated. It's historic. It tells you the history of these houses. It doesn't, you know, there's a lot of people trying to reinvent history, but these houses, they are the houses. So please vote this down. Don't put the camel's nose under the tent. We don't need it. Thank you. Ms. Coviello. Susan Coviello, oh, I'm sorry. Susan Coviello, Six Burnham Court. Um, I, you can vote for this or not vote for this, but I know that when I drive through Ipswich, and I go by the houses that all have the plaques on them, I always look and I always think about that. And I think, wow, that is so cool. These houses are really ancient and I'm allowed to see how old they are because the plaques are on there, which is one of the things they want to do with this. If you opt in, I don't think that the historical house police are gonna come and <laughs> ransack your homes like Mr. Neal suggested. I also drive, work at S in Gloucester every day, and I drive down a street. I don't know the name of it, but it's lined with antique homes, and they all have plaques on them, and I know that that was a proof fish thing in Gloucester, and it was wonderful. Um, I'm married to Robert Coviello, and in town we have owned three historical properties, and they are gems. Uh, we own one of them now, plus our house that's not historical at all. Um, and I know that what I know the impact that I felt and the pride that I do feel and that I know my husband has felt about owning a historical piece of property in town. I think the historical commission gets laughed at and I don't really understand why because there are such wonderful homes in this area. They are not asking to do anything untoward. They're asking to do a survey, find out what we have in this town, offer a plaque if someone owns an antique house and would like to have one and respect what we have, respect the history here while we still have it. Thank you. I just wanted to address the, the concept of intrusiveness. If, you, if you've ever seen the, the Google Earth car drive down your street, uh, taking a picture of your house for this purpose would be no more intrusive than that. And actually, if you want to have some fun, go to Salem Deeds. You know my name now. You, you can look me up, you can see my deed to my house, what date I bought it, what I paid for it, and what the previous deed, who I bought it from, and if you look that up, you can keep going all the way to 1600. So the idea that this is intrusive is just simply false. The information is all out there, and if that's uncomfortable for some and you want to try to protect that, that's a different thing, but that's, I have no interest in being intrusive, I don't have time for one thing. <laughs> but, and I, I do want to thank Mr. Neal, he challenges me and has helped this a lot. I've crystallized my thinking on it quite a bit. Sir. Sarah Cushing, 136 Kenomo Point Road. Um, I've been a part of the Essex Shipbuilding Museum and Historical Society for many years. In the past, they have done numerous um, old house tours for, as fundraisers. As part of those projects, they have done research, gotten information about the houses from the homeowners at the time. That uh, information is available at the Essex Shipbuilding Museum. Um, and I wonder if the Historical Commission ever talks to the Historical Society because it would be a really good thing to do. As far as um, 
Susan said about plaques, uh, years ago, the Historical Society had a fundraiser where people made uh, plaques. They actually have little, they're wooden with little schooners on them that have the dates of the houses. And if people, homeowners, wanted to put them on their houses, they could buy them from the Historical Society and put them on their houses. And I believe the church has one, uh, the uh, par church parsonage, Congregational Church Parsonage has one. And I believe there's another one on Main Street nearby. And I mean, I've seen them around. Um, I don't know, I know that that's something, those were made um, individually, um, some by Charlie Burnham and some by Charlie Ridge, and um, sold as a fundraiser for the museum. I don't know if there's anybody at the museum or if anybody has asked the museum if they wanted a plaque, but I bet, I bet, I know there are people at the museum that are quite capable of building those plaques, and I bet if you paid them a sum as a donation, that you could have a plaque on your house too. So I don't see why we have to pay $10,000 when we're concerned about our taxes going up and paying for overrides and going to cost us six, six to $800 each in taxes, why we should be paying $10,000 for something that the Historical Society has already done. Thank you. Thank you. Cliff. Thank you. I'd like to join that sentiment. If you want to put a plaque on your house, go, right, go ahead and do it. Um, I, put, I could put four plaques on my house, uh, uh, 1860, 1935, 1985, and tw uh, 2010. So I'd buy a lot of plaques. I, I just don't see the benefit to, to this at all for the town. Thank you. Thank you. Rob? Uh, Rob Fitzgibbon, 18 Main Street. Um, on Main Street, we actually have plaques. We've got these cool little wooden ships, and uh, we just took ours down because we're getting painted. But um, I don't know. I'm kind of like betwixt and between with this one. Um, I do think it's like, I mean, town meeting, where else can you spend 20 minutes discussing a 10,000 K purchase and eight seconds approving a $8 million school budget? Um, okay, I guess like the, the kind of question is, um, historically, um, it's usually been people in the town that have done the actual sort of surveys themselves. Like uh, there was a, a very famous school teacher named Mady Polly's in the um, late 1800s, early 1900s that did a lot of the original data. Um, there is, as Ed Neal pointed out, all of this stuff is available online. Um, if there was a need for a survey, it's probably because most of the data stops around 1979. Um, I don't know, it's not a ton of money. Um, I think that maybe if the applicant or the um, person that, that, that forwarded the article were willing to perhaps strike the word property from the article, that maybe have a better chance of passing. Thank you. Christopher Wolf for Saugenies Creek. I move the question. Second. We have a motion to move the question. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? No. The, motion, the motion is to move the question to a vote. Okay. We're going to do this again because I'm a little concerned that people missed what was being voted on. This is a motion to move the question so that we can take the main article to a vote, which has been seconded. So all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. <laughs> motion carries. We're now going to vote. All right. All those in favor of Article 29 say aye. All those opposed? No. Motion, fa ca motion fails. Article 30. Ms. Perrine. I, Ruth R. Perrine, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $24,000 to purchase bulletproof vests for the police department. Do we have a second? Second. Discussion? So, believe it or not, bulletproof vests actually have a lifespan. They are normally uh, good for five to ten years, and the armor can break down as well as certain materials can degrade over time. This is a situation where the town would be funding the, the bulletproof vests up front for $24,000, and 
we may receive up to half of that money back from, I believe it's a grant fund. We've been seconded. Any further discussion? Yes, I just have a question. I think it's fabulous that we go for grant funding. I know like the computer I asked about, um, the copy or whatever, but per the best, that when we know that every six years we're going to do this, that, and the other, couldn't we sort of set aside money or the budget or whatever so we're not adding a big chunk every six years for our taxes and all that kind of stuff? Okay. Yeah, Brenda, can you go over So, for example, the, the copier and, and the, now the bulletproof vest, that's coming out of money that, um, that is called free cash, which comes from either taking in more revenue than we planned or not spending everything that we plan to spend. So we like to utilize that for its one-time money, right, because it gets certified by the state once a year, and we like to use that for one-time purchases particularly things that are of a smaller, um, sm a lower value. We do have actually funds, many funds set aside for um, larger things like emergency vehicles and building funds and such, and we generally put money into those in the fall. But for more minor purchases, we utilize this one-time money to, to purchase these one-time smaller items. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Doucette, Article 31. I, Daniel Doucette, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash a sum of $50,000 to be used to match a federal or state grant for the purchase of new fire department radios, um, to purchase and equip a new tanker, and to purchase and equip a new air pack filling station and anything incidental or related there too. Thank you. We have a second? So, Any discussion? So those three items are not on the, um, there's no money coming from the town other than this is a match. If those grants are awarded, it's uh, three grants that have been applied for. Um, the, like I said, the air pack filling station, our tanker truck, which is a 1992, so we're trying to get a federal grant. Those are the monies. Uh, typically it's a 5% match from the town, and that's what that amount is for total up to 50 for the, all three grants. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Doucette, you are up again. I, Article Daniel Doucette, move that the town vote to transfer from the ambulance fund the sum of $8,500 for the purchase of, purpose of purchasing two laptop computers and accessories to the fire department's ambulances and anything incidental or related thereto. Do we have a second? second. Discussion. That's a transfer from the Ambulance Reserve Fund, which is our revenue, our revenues generated by transports. Um, documentation software is how the EMTs document the, the trips. That's how the, it's all forwarded to the hospital, the medical records, as well as uh, the billing aspects and how we collect the revenue. So they're just uh, outdated and need to be replaced. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Article 33. We have a change in movements. I, Ruth R. Perrine, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $50,000 to be used as a match to a state grant for the improvement of Centennial Grove and, any, and to anything related, incidental or related thereto. Do a second? Discussion. So this is a situation where we've actually partnered with the Ipswich YMCA to apply for a grant for $500,000 to do some repairs at the Grove. We're looking at doing... Um, Drilling a well, tight tanks, restroom facilities, and heating. And um, this is in addition to the generous donation of a resident of town that's actually renovating the pavilion, plus $150,000 that was appropriated to past um, 
past town meeting, so we're, we're looking at about a million dollars up at the Grove, but this 50000 is part of the $500,000 grant match that we're partnering with with the Ipswich YMCA. Do we have any assurance that we're not creating something that everyone in the state uh, will have access to and we won't be able to limit the use for Essex residents only? Mr. Bricky. We're being very, very um, careful in the grant application to point out that it is a residence only facility, but that members of the general public can also enjoy it if they attend the camp, uh, utilize the sports facilities in leagues, uh, or they uh, rent the facility um, as maybe somebody from out of town that pays a rental fee. So we're being very, very careful to explain that right up front. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 35, I believe, Wesley, it's you. Oh, excuse me, 34. Lee Burnham, move the town transfer from free cash, sum of $17,000. Cemetery mapping software and any incidental or related thereto. We have a second. Any discussion? Uh, briefly, this is we're buying a, com uh, a computer program to put in uh, so we can digitize the entire cemetery. Right now, it's all on paper and cards. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Article 35, Ms. Harris. Aye, Jody Harris. Move the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $20,000 to improve, maintain, and beautify certain areas under the town's ownership or control, including the purchase of supplies, any necessary design services, and any necessary site work, and anything incidental or related thereto. We have a second. Discussion. This is um, a continuation of the causeway project, uh, mostly the pocket parks. Uh, in the next week or so, you'll start to see the money that we appropriated the last town meeting from free cash to uh, refurbish the pocket parks in the downtown district. Um, uh, this will also provide uh, new plantings and prepare uh, our town to look beautiful for Essex in Bloom, which is being held on May 19th and 20th. And... Um, We'll also start to include the 24 Martin Street um, site, the old uh, fire station, in uh, looking at what we're going to do next there. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 36, Wesley. I, Wesley Burnham, move the town vote to transfer from the sewer enterprise free cash the sum of $40,000 to design and or engineer and or construct repairs, upgrades, improvements, and or replacements to any aspect of the municipal sewer system, anything incidental or related thereto. Do we have a second? Any discussion? Uh, this one is for the continuing replacement of those uh, yeah. sewer grinder, grinder pumps. Sorry about that. Uh, this project started back in about 2020. There's 203 total pumps in service. We've replaced 142 with the upgraded models. And so there's 61 left to go. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 37. Wesley. Mr. Moderator, point of order. 
I'm sorry, where did it come from? Oh, yes. I, I, um, so I was, wanted to make a motion to uh, reconsider Article 34, and I'm so sorry. I'll explain why. Um, Wesley mentioned that this was $17,500 uh, to for cemetery software. And I was thinking, like, after we passed it, like, wait a minute, why can't you just use Excel? So maybe you could, like, explain to us, like, why you need $17,000 of, of a cemetery database. Uh, and then Mr. We can Fitzgibbons, that's out of order. Okay. We've already dealt with the article. Unless you're filing a motion to reconsider, we are I am, I am filing a motion to reconsider. I'm explaining why I'm filing a motion to reconsider. Well, the motion to reconsider would be to reconsider the vote with regard to Article 34. So. Sounds good. Okay, please write it up. I need it in writing. Rob, thanks. Yeah, when people make motions, as you know, it has to be in writing. But if you come up here, we actually have, we, the royal we, Pam has made sure we have forms here that you can fill out that makes it a little faster. Okay, we have a motion to reconsider Article 34. Is there a second? Motion has been seconded. Discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? No. Motion fails. Okay. Article 37. Mr. Burnham. Hi, Wesley Burnham. Move that the town vote to transfer from the Water Enterprise free cash a sum of $50,000 to design and or engineer and or construct repairs, upgrades, improvements, and or replacements to any aspect of the municipal water system and anything incidental or related thereto. Motion having been seconded. Any discussion? Uh, briefly, this is most. This money is going for uh, predominantly installing individual isolation valves and water meters to the units down on Canoma Point. Right now, they're billed only on a single meter for the entire unit. We're going to split it up for individuals. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. <laughs> Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 38, Mr. Fippen. I, Peter D. Fippen, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $10,000 to hire duly licensed private parties to trap green crabs within Essex and dispose of said green crabs and anything incidental and related thereto. Said appropriation being in addition to any grant or gift funds that may be received in connection with this activity. Any discussion? So the invasive green crab is still fairly prolific in Essex Bay, uh, probably especially after this mild winter we've had. As you know, the green crab wreaks havoc on our treasured soft shell clam, as well as a lot of other problems. This money is going to be used to match state funds, which currently are at uh, an earmark level of 75000 in the House uh, version of the budget right now. Um, the last few years, we've gotten this money without a problem, so we're just matching that. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Article 39, Mr. Tetzloff. Uh, I.J. Tetzloff moved that the town appropriate or reserve from fiscal year 2024 Community Preservation Fund estimated annual revenues or other available funds, all as specified on the Community Preservation Act town meeting handout, the amounts recommended by the Community Preservation Committee for Open Space Reserve, Historic Resources Reserve, Community Housing Reserve, Budgeted Reserve, Administrative Expenses, and Special Projects or Transfers. Um, Second. 
Thank you. Any discussion? Do you want to discuss it? Uh, everybody's probably read the handout. Uh, the big item here, there was one item that came before the CPC this year, and it was to fund the Affordable Housing Trust for $100,000. I, I want to make sure everybody understands that. Um, and to my knowledge, that's the first funding of the trust. Um, and I guess my question on it, I know the trust has met at least once uh, since the CPC did. Can anyone comment as to what the near-term plan is for that? Any any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Article 40, Ms. Perrine. I, Ruth R. Perrine, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $11,000 to the sticker printing line item in the transfer station recycling department for the initial order of the pay-as-you-throw trash bags necessary to implement the town's pay-as-you-throw solid waste disposal program and anything incidental or related thereto. Discussion? I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We need our first order of pay-as-you-throw bags. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Article 41, Ms. McKinnon. I, Nina McKinnon, move that Article 41 be indefinitely postponed. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Article 41 is indefinitely postponed. Article 42, the last article on the warrant. Mr. Burnham, you get the honor of the last article. I will tell everyone, however, this article requires a four-fifths vote. Really? I, Wesley Burnham, move that the town vote to transfer from free cash the sum of $3,963 for the payment of an unpaid bill from the past fiscal year. This is actually to pay a bill for road salt from December of 21. It wasn't, the bill was never received or sent out, and we didn't receive it until the fall of 22. Any f it is what it is. A second. <laughs> he second, I know. Any any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? I declare the motion carried. I'll entertain a motion to dissolve. Seconded? We are dissolved for the evening, folks. Thank you. No.